Welcome back. Today we are going to talk about meeting the resident's needs with personal care and grooming. So we want to be, we want to make sure to respect the preferences and habits of our residents and accommodate for them as much as possible. We may not be able to hit everything due to regulations, but um, say your resident likes to take a shower at night before they go to bed. Okay, let's try to see if we can make that happen. Or if a resident likes to take a bath every morning when they get up. Again, within reason, we can try to help them out and accommodate as much as possible. So if you have a resident that is on a three time a week bathing schedule and they say, well, I really want to go to four times a week if we can do that and I want to bathe on these certain days, get with your charge nurse and see how you can make it happen. Or if there's some kind of reason why you might not be able to do that, then that can be um, hopefully explained to the resident pretty well. So some different age changes that we have, our skin is thinner and drier, as well as our hair getting thinner and drier. Um, our skin is less elastic and less resilient to subject when subjected to stressors. So a lot of residents may not need to bathe nearly as often. Um, they may not develop body odor as much or as often as people that are younger and have a more active lifestyle do. So some people may only want to bathe twice a week. Some people may only want to bathe once a week, and that's okay. As long as their body is clean, then and they're happy, then yeah, that's all they need. There is no regulation that says how often a resident has to be bathed or how they have to be bathed. As long as the resident is clean and they don't have any foul-smelling body odor, they're good. So some different dental um, dental things with your aging changes. Some people may have lost teeth, some people might have a dental prosthetic, or they might have loose teeth, or they might have dentures. So just kind of be aware of that, and we'll teach you how to take care of those. Also, residents may have decreased saliva. This is another reason why it's important to promote hydration for our residents. So every time that you go in to see a resident, offer them a drink. Ask them if they need a little sip to keep their mouth moist. Even if they don't like to drink a whole lot, Anything is better than nothing, so kind of help out with that. There's also some different um, saliva replacement products. If a resident really doesn't like to drink or they can't, maybe they have swallowing issues and they're not allowed to drink regular liquids and they really don't like to thicken liquids, but their mouth gets dry. So there's some different saliva sprays that you can spray in their mouth to keep their mouth moist and keep their lips from getting dry and cracking. So your hair gets thinner as you grow older and you might have drier hair. So you may have residents, especially some of the older ladies, that like to go to the beauty shop once a week. If they go to the beauty shop once a week, they don't need to have their hair done any other time. Their head is not producing the amount of oils that they would on a younger and more active person. So once a week to go to the beauty shop is fine. And kind of think again about personal appearance because a lot of women that go to the beauty shop, they pay a pretty good amount of money for that. So if somebody goes and gets their hair curled and set or gets a permanent where their hair is curly, please don't take a brush to it the next day and brush it all out and kind of, you know, ruin the time and money and effort that that beautician has spent. Um, some of your residents may do that themselves and that's up to them, but please don't kind of be contributing to that cause. So some different illnesses may change the frequency of skin care. If you have somebody with fever, a lot of times they're going to be sweating. So you're going to want to provide skin care more often to keep their skin from breaking down. Um, there may be some other different illnesses that will cause some skin changes. Some illnesses may make your skin very, very dry, um, such as kidney failure. Then you get very, very dry skin with that. Um, incontinence is another big thing. If somebody is incontinent, they really need meticulous skin care to take care of everything and to keep their skin from breaking down. So that's something to definitely be aware of. Dementia. Dementia will influence how the CNA approaches and assists assist the resident with personal hygiene as with everything else that you do for the resident or with the resident. So if you've got somebody with dementia and say, they have never liked taking a bath or shower. Do you think they're going to want to do that now, now that they have dementia and they really don't understand what's going on? Probably not. So do your best to try to 
you know, help the resident understand, maybe gesture that, you know, you can help them take a shower or see if they have a favorite person that they like that will help with, with them or whatever it is. But just know that dementia may produce a little bit more challenge with doing bathing. And we do have a video after this called Bathing Without a Battle that really goes into how to bathe and really talks about dementia um, and how to kind of accommodate for the dementia and help people still get their baths and stay clean. So please watch that one. It's a really, well, it's next in the, this, in the presentations, but it's a very, very good video. Um, has a lot of good information. It is a little bit older, but it's the same concepts. You really, really um, will get a lot of good information out of that one. So some different adaptive devices can also help the resident perform everyday self-care activities and help them maintain independence. These are things like shoehorns, buttonhole hooks, um, oh, some sock aids. There's something that they can stretch their socks over and then stick their foot in. So these are some of the different things that maybe occupational therapy can help out with as well. So let's talk about oral hygiene. So when we're caring for the resident's mouth, it's not just the teeth. We also have to think about the gums and the tongue and then any removable appliances like a partial or dentures. So we want to remove food particles and plaque that promote bacterial growth because people can get infections in their mouth, um, like gingivitis, from um, leaving food there. So the bacterial growth can cause inflammation of the gums gingivitis, <laughs> dental decay, and can also contribute to systemic infections. So what this means that the systemic infections mean is some people, if they have maybe some differences in their heart anatomy, and they do pretty good, but they're more susceptible to infections. So if they have an infection in their mouth, sometimes that infection can go into their bloodstream and set up shop in their heart. While their heart is providing that constant blood flow and nutrients through it, so that bacteria is just going to grow and grow and grow. This may be a lot of reason why, if you've ever heard of people taking antibiotics before they get dental procedures, that's one of the things um, that it can prevent is getting an infection in your heart or an infection in somewhere else, especially if you've had a joint replacement. So we want to maintain our moisture in our mouth cavity to help promote healthy gums and teeth. So this is helping by brushing the teeth, using mouthwash if people want to, um, if people can't brush their teeth, maybe use some swab sticks, which we'll kind of talk about, and then um, using that saliva substitute. Also, refreshing the resident's mouth will help promote appetite. Some of our residents may not want to eat as well um, if they have dental issues. So if they have loose or missing teeth or they have ill-fitting dentures, that's going to make it a lot harder for them to be able to eat. Also, if they still have food in their teeth from the last time they ate, they may get confused, especially if they have dementia, and think, oh, well, there's food in my mouth. I don't need to eat. I'm not hungry. So definitely need to keep their mouth clean for promoting nutrition as well. Um, whenever you are providing mouth care, make sure that you report any signs of problems. So if you see any redness in their gums or any bleeding or any missing or broken teeth that you hadn't noticed before, then definitely let your nurse know. So mouth care, including brushing the teeth and dentures, is generally done at least twice a day, in the morning and at bedtime. And mouth care is also needed even if the resident has no teeth or dentures. This is very, very important that you provide good gum care to people that don't have dentures because they can still get gingivitis in their gums and then it can move into the bones in their jaw. So we want to keep the resident free from infection. So make sure when you're giving good mouth care, even if the person has dentures or no teeth at all, that you provide good gum care. So as with every other activity of daily living or ADL that we do, we want to encourage resident independence. So encourage your resident to do as much as possible for themselves. Set up and cue for them as needed, and then use assistive devices as needed. 
So you may only need to get the toothbrush out of their medicine cabinet, um, wet it, and put the toothpaste on. They may do the rest. Um, for people with dementia, you may have to get the toothbrush out, wet it, put the toothpaste on, and demonstrate for them how to use it. So maybe you hold the toothbrush up in front of your face and kind of move it up and down in front of your mouth. Some of them may get it after that. Because remember with dementia, you're just not really thinking quite right. And that toothbrush, you might think, is used to comb your hair. So just kind of keep that in mind that you may have to demonstrate for some of your people with dementia. Also using assistive devices, if somebody has a hard time holding onto the toothbrush, you may need some kind of foam padding or some other kind of thing to build up the toothbrush and um, you know make it easier for the person to hold and absolutely help them as much as they need to but promote independence as much as you can. So recognize some different situations that need attention. So if you have a resident with facial weakness, sometimes as a result of a stroke or any other impairment, they may accumulate food debris between their gums and their cheek, which is called pocketing. Make sure that you get this pocketed food taken care of because otherwise it's just going to sit there and continue to grow possible bacteria in the mouth and break down the teeth and the cheeks and the gums. So you want to get that taken care of and get the person's mouth refreshed. Some other situations that might need attention is a person who has very little fluid intake, is unresponsive, or they're just, they're not awake, they're not able to respond to you. Someone who's receiving oxygen or who is a mouth breather will need more frequent care. So if you have somebody that has very little fluid intake um, or any of these other situations, their mouth is gonna become dry a lot more quickly than somebody else. So even if somebody is responsive and can't is unresponsive and can't tell you, oh my mouth is really dry, I need to kind of take care of it, you still need to think about that. So as we kind of talked about um, with meeting our personal our residents' needs um, for comfort in the earlier chapters, then we turn the residents, you know, every couple hours, check for, check for incontinence, and then we will give them a drink. So if you have somebody that's unresponsive, you're still going to do these things. So you're going to turn them every couple hours, check for incontinence and take care of it. And then most of the time you're going to use um, a mouth sponge or a swab and swab their mouth out to kind of keep their mouth refreshed um, and keep it hydrated. Make sure with people that are unresponsive that you get those mouth swabs kind of damp but not wet because those people that are unresponsive are not going to be able to swallow properly if some of that fluid does get into their throat and it will go down into their lungs. So be careful about that. Oxygen also, especially an oxygen mask, will dry out your mouth very quickly as well because you've got all that oxygen going through, going over your mouth. Yes, it may be kind of humidified, but sometimes it just doesn't quite do the trick. So report any observations that you have to your nurse and always follow standard precautions while giving mouth care. You always want to wear clean gloves while you're contacting any bodily fluids. So if there's a potential that you might come in contact with the bodily fluids such as saliva, you definitely want to wear, mouth, wear gloves while you're um, giving that mouth care. So some different things that we can use to help with dental care um, are some different toothbrushes. There's lots of different toothbrushes with different angles on their necks and different size heads and lots of different features. The main thing you need to think about is make sure that you have one with soft bristles. Now your facility um, and or the residents should be providing um, the toothbrush so you will be able to have that at your disposal. So some different things um, you can do when positioning and moving the brush. For the front teeth, use a 45 degree angle and use short strokes from the gum to the crown or the end of the tooth. The inside of the front teeth, also at a 45 degree angle, you can use short strokes from the gum to the crown or the end of the tooth. The inner surface of the teeth, use a horizontal angle and back and forth strokes. And then you can also use short strokes from the gum to the crown of the tooth. And then the biting surface, use back and forth strokes. 
Now, one thing that I have seen as well is to use a jiggle sweep method. So you kind of take the toothbrush at a 45 degree angle at the gums and kind of jiggle it back and forth a couple times and then you sweep the debris away from the gums or sweep the um, food away from the gums. So whatever way your facility wants you to do that, um, just follow their policy. But generally the jiggle sweep method works pretty well or using the short strokes from the gums away from the end of the teeth. So the gum and tongue, you'll need to care for that residence gum and tongue. If there's anything specific in the care plan for that, make sure that you follow it. Um, some of the toothbrushes will actually have a gum cleaner on the back of it, all those neat little knobby things on the back surface of the toothbrush, the opposite side of the bristles. Um, that will be a tongue cleaner. So you can use that to kind of use um, stroke the tongue going from the back and working your way forward to scrape some of the bacteria and the debris off the tongue. So if you see any findings on the gums and the tongue, make sure that you report those to the nurse. So check your residence care plan for flossing. So the technique is going to kind of vary, but generally you're going to wrap the floss around your middle finger on each hand and then move the floss up and down motion between the teeth and make sure that you get, you know, from the, move the floss up and down from the gum to the crown and from the crown to the gum. So you want to get kind of in between the teeth down to the gum and kind of jiggle it back and forth as you're pulling the floss out from the gum to the crown of the teeth. So dentures, some residents may have a dental prosthesis such as a bridge, which is removable or permanent partial or full dentures. Now these are really, really expensive. What we need to do to take care of the dentures is we need to make sure we hold them properly. Now, when you hold the dentures properly, don't squeeze them from the sides because this can actually make the dentures break. So what you wanna do is hold the dentures from the bottom of, well, what would be the gums, um, to the top of the crown of the teeth. So kind of hold them in the middle, maybe stick your index finger on the bottom side and your thumb on the top side or whatever. As long as you've got it held there in the middle of the teeth, kind of near the um, front of the bottom teeth. So the bottom teeth are the ones that are really more prone to being broken by squeezing them from the sides. And when you're providing denture care, you really need to put a towel or a washcloth in the bottom of the sink to provide for a barrier or a cushion just in case you drop them. Because again, those dentures are very, very expensive. Dentures can also be a dignity issue for a resident because they, you know, a lot of people with dentures don't want to go out without their teeth in. So there's, they have dentures for a reason and didn't just choose to not have teeth. So we want to take care of those dentures and they are very, very expensive. Dentures sometimes can be lost in the laundry. So whenever you are putting somebody's laundry into the basket or sending it down to the laundry service, make sure that you check their pockets. Some people like to stick their dentures, especially in the chest pocket of a shirt and they forget it's there. And then it goes down to laundry. And if the dentures go through the laundry, they may get broken. They also may be left at the dining table or on a tray if people are eating. Sometimes people with dentures like to take them out whenever they're done eating and kind of let their mouth rest. So if they leave the dentures on the tray or at the dining room table, those dentures may be lost to the trash. So really, really pay attention to that, especially if your residents don't understand um, that they really need to hang on to their dentures. So some denture storage. You want to use um, denture cups and follow your facility policy and procedure with how those denture cups need to be labeled because a lot of times you'll put the resident's name and their room number in them and you know make sure that you store them whenever wherever your facility states that you should. So a lot of places will put them in the top drawer of the med cart or some places may put them up in the 
medicine cabinet or some people may just leave them at the bedside. Depends on what your facility policy is and what your residence preference is. But make sure that you know where your residence um, denture storage cup is supposed to be. So when you're taking dentures out, when you're removing and replacing the dentures from the resident's mouth, make sure that you follow those standard precautions and wear gloves. And whenever we remove dentures, they're usually done at bedtime. And you want to grasp with your thumb and index finger and use a piece of gauze if it's slippery. So one of the things you can do is you can put your fingers in the resident's mouth and kind of take the tips of your fingers up on the side of their dentures and pull very, very gently pull down a little bit and that will help loosen some of the suction that's been created by the dentures. If that doesn't work, especially with the top dentures, you may be able to take your thumb, put it in the middle of the top of the resident's mouth, right in the middle of their palate and push up a little bit. Sometimes that will also break that vacuum seal that's been caused by the dentures and then you can gently pull the dentures out. A lot of your residents are going to be able to do this themselves, but if they can't, then that's how you would be able to get them out, and we'll practice that. So denture insertion, when you put the upper dentures in, you want to hold it firmly with one hand and raise the upper lip with the other, because if you try to put the dentures in without raising the upper lip, the upper lip may actually get caught in the dentures, and that would be uncomfortable for the person that then you wouldn't be able to get it in their mouth. So you want to insert the denture and gently press with your index finger um, kind of up into the gums on the bottom of the teeth to check for fit and placement. So the lower dentures you're going to hold with the thumb and index finger and you want to pull the lower lip down slightly. So kind of the opposite of the upper. And then also you want to insert the denture and gently press to check fit and placement. So the water temperature for cleaning the dentures, you should be using cool water. Hot water will sometimes warp the dentures, so you want to be using cool water for these. So as you're cleaning those dentures, you want to clean the outer surface in a back and forth motion. Hold them over the sink. Sometimes you may want to fill the sink halfway with water or you may want to just hold, it, hold the dentures in your hand, but make sure to line the sink with a towel to protect from breakage if you drop them. Then the inner surface, make sure that you have the brush positioned vertically or up and down and use upward strokes. So you want to get everything kind of clean. Make sure that you do not use regular toothpaste on dentures. Regular toothpaste has a lot more abrasives in it and it will actually damage the dentures and make little cavities where bacteria and infection can grow. So make sure that you do not use regular toothpaste on dentures and there are also some specific denture brushes that you can use that have little cone-shaped bristles on the back that can get into all the little crevices and get rid of all that um, built-up fixident or whatever you use to hold the dentures in place. So also, you also want to make sure that people rinse their mouth after they take their dentures out just to make sure any of that um, adhesive gets out of their mouth and you know make sure the mouth is clean in case they got any food between the dentures and their gums. Um, you want to moisturize their lips and report to the, the following to the nurse. If the resident has report of a bad taste, um, if they have a whitish coating, redness or swelling in the mouth and on the tongue, that could indicate that they have an infection. If they have any cracked lips or dry mouth, also check to see if you have any sores on the mouth. Now these can be caused by rough areas, chipped areas, sharp areas, um, also missing teeth can cause different sores in the mouth. So if the dentures are not fitting well, then the person may have them rub up against the gum instead of just sitting on the gums. And that can cause a lot of discomfort and problems with the person trying to eat. So mouth care on an unresponsive person, you want to position them for aspiration prevention. So aspiration is getting 
food or liquids down into your lungs when it's supposed to go into your stomach. So you always want to follow the resident care plan. Turn the resident on one side and turn their head well to the side. So make sure they're completely on their side with their head turned to the side. Um, the fluid will not run out of their mouth. It may pocket in their cheek. So use a small amount of fluid. So protect the bed with a waterproof cover if you need to. And some different materials for oral care. You can always use um, a cleaning agent, check your care plan, the sponge swabs, a water glass, a hand towel, an emesis basin, of course your gloves, and paper towels. You may need to use a tongue depressor to keep the mouth open. Don't use the fingers to hold the mouth open because even though somebody is not responsive and they won't wake up when you talk to them or touch them, they may still have reflexes and might try to bite down on your finger if you stick it in their mouth. Sometimes people will think things are food if you put it in their mouth and they'll try to bite them. So don't put your finger in their mouth. So what you're going to want to do with this is you've got those sponge swabs and maybe put it in a cleaning agent. Otherwise, just use some water. Dip the sponge swab in the water or cleaning agent and kind of squeeze it out a little bit to get the excess off. Hold the mouth open with the tongue depressor and just start swabbing the mouth and gums, the teeth and gums. Um, swab all around on the inside of their cheek, on the gums, and around the teeth, and on their tongue to keep the mouth moist. You may also need to use um, lip care. This is very, very important for somebody that's unresponsive because they're not getting anything to drink, so their mouth is going to start cracking. So you want to moisturize very, very frequently. And there are some products out there that are kind of liquidy um, that you can squeeze from a tube, and it's okay to get it in their mouth. So just check with your facility about what kind of products that you use to see if it's okay to get it in their mouth or not, or if you need to just keep it on their lips only. So dentures, just don't go there with an unconscious person because you don't want them to have the dentures you know, slip out and then kind of sleep on them or have the dentures fall back into the back of their mouth. That would not be a good thing. So just don't put them in for somebody that's unconscious. So some different bath options. These are going to be gone over a lot in the Bathing Without a Battle video, so I'll just kind of briefly talk about them. There's some different creative bath options that are available, and you want to make sure that you um, check your care plan for that. Check to see what the person's restorative goals are as well, and to see if there's anything that they can do to help or that they're supposed to help. And and make sure that you understand effective approaches for bathing residents with dementia. Some people, when they hear the word shower, will freak out because they don't like showers. Sometimes if you refer to bathing as a wash-up, even if the person does not get into the shower, but they may stand in front of the sink, you know, get the washcloth wet, get the soap, and bathe themselves that way. That's okay. Again, there is no regulation that says you have to get a person into the shower as long as they are clean and hygienic. So just kind of keep in mind what kind of wording you may need to use for somebody, especially with dementia or somebody that's not familiar with your terminology. So after you give somebody a bath or help them get cleaned up, then they want to put on fresh clothing and make sure you comb their hair. Now remember when you're combing your hair, especially with ladies that may have longer hair, hold your head, hold your hand on the crown of their head and then comb away from their head. This is really important because some people may have very sensitive scalps or they may have knots in their hair. And if you don't hold your head, hold your hand, I'm sorry, on the crown of their head or on their head where you're combing from, then it may pull on their hair and be very painful. So be really careful with that. So you always want to plan ahead and get all of your supplies, such as cleanser. So the skin is often cleaned with soap that has moisturizing properties to help prevent dryness. And some soaps are designed to be rinse-free or waterless. So these are really, really good ones, um, especially the waterless ones. 
you can get a resident clean without actually ever having to get water on them. So what this means is you can take a waterless cleanser, maybe squirt some onto a washcloth and wipe it onto the resident's skin, then go back and take a towel and wipe it off. Now those waterless um, cleansers have been proven that they will break down skin debris and dirt and oils just as well as regular soaps in a shower and get people just as clean. So that is a great, great alternative for somebody that's terrified of getting in the shower that doesn't like it. So you need to understand what kind of soap a resident uses and check on the care plan. So you want to check and plan ahead. Check for needed supplies before starting. Hopefully the last person that helped bathe your resident will have replaced the supplies. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. So if you're getting ready to give somebody a bath or a shower, then you want to make sure that you have all of the supplies that is needed. So you want to make sure you have plenty of soap, shampoo, washcloths, towels, everything that you need. Make sure you got their clothes in the bathroom with you or wherever you're giving them a shower or bath and that you're ready to go. Absolutely privacy. Privacy, privacy, privacy. Pull that curtain. If you're given a bed bath, pull the curtain, shut the door, close the blinds. Only uncover what you need for that resident. So if you're doing the lower half of their body, there's no reason for their upper half of their body to be uncovered unless they absolutely really want it to be. So if they say, nope, I'm okay laying here without anything on, you can go ahead and do what you need to do, then okay. But most of the time we're going to try to keep our residents covered because not only is that a privacy issue, if somebody walks in the door and they're seeing that resident in all their glory, um, other, also the resident may get very cold very quickly because you lose all of your heat through your skin. So. They might get really, really cold and be uncomfortable and feel very exposed if you uncover more than you need to at the time. So always follow your standard precautions. Make sure that you wear gloves. Um, this says wear gloves when you're bathing the genital or perineal area if the resident or the CNA has skin breaks. I say wear gloves all the time when you're given a bath just in case, because you never know what kind of stuff you're going to come into, skin breaks. Um, you don't want to have to stop in the middle of your bath and put on a pair of gloves. You can absolutely do that, but if you already have the gloves on, then you'll be ready to go. So always wash from the cleaner body areas to the less clean, starting with the face. Don't put soap on the face washcloth unless you use baby soap or baby shampoo, because if you put soap on that face washcloth, then you can get soap in the resident's eyes and that can be very, very uncomfortable for them and make them actually tear up and cry. So we don't want to do that. So you want to start with the face, no soap, just warm water on a washcloth. Then work maybe down the arms, on the chest, on the legs, and then on the feet. Then turn them over onto their other side. Work on the back, down the arms down the legs, down the feet, and then do your perineal area last. So work on that genital area and the rectal area last so that you get to the kind of what we think of the dirty areas um, or less clean areas last. Report any skin observations to your nurse or any kind of observations. If you see any bruising, if you see any skin tears, if you see any redness, if you see any dryness, um, if you see that the resident is kind of scared for you to give them a bath, there may be something else going on. So just kind of anything that's out of the ordinary, make sure that you report those observations to your nurse. So I may have gotten a little bit ahead of myself, but some different observations to report to your nurse when bathing your resident. Always any kind of changes in skin and condition, skin conditions, any changes in temperature. So if you have somebody that normally has pretty warm feet and today they're pretty cold, definitely let the nurse know. Any changes in skin color on the skin, lips, nail beds, and sclera or the whites of their eyes, let them know. If you have any kind of bluish areas on their fingertips or um, around their lips, then that means they may have poor circulation or not enough oxygen going around and that's called cyanosis, C-Y-A-N-O-S-I-S, -S, cyanosis, having bluish tint to the skin. 
So also let them know any location and description of rashes, any dry skin, bruises or open skin areas, any pale or reddened areas, in particular over the bony areas, that could be the beginning of a pressure ulcer or decubitus. Any drainage and bleeding from body openings or any wounds, if they have any blood coming out of their urethra or, you know, drainage coming out of their rectum or wherever, or any calluses and corns on the feet. Another thing that might be on the next slide, but just in case, Another thing that you need to report to the nurse, um, especially on your diabetics, are ingrown nails. Ingrown fingernails and ingrown toenails. So we want to make sure that we um, hit all those points when we're reporting our observations to the nurse. Now a lot of places will not even let you clip the nails of a resident. They may let you file them. So. When it comes to diabetics though, and people on blood thinner medications, you may not be allowed to even file the resident's nails. If you are allowed to file them, then the one thing you can never, never do, never cut a diabetic's nails. That is the job of an RN. And sometimes it's even only the job of, of a podiatrist, a specially trained foot doctor that will deal with that. So just be aware of your facility policy and be aware of who's diabetic and who isn't or who's on blood thinners and who isn't. And if you're not sure, just ask your nurse, ask your fellow CNAs, ask your CMAs, and check on the care plan for sure. So when you're moving somebody to and from the shower, make sure that you use good body mechanics and infection control. So your resident may re be required to be transferred to a shower by a wheelchair and then transferred to the shower chair, or they may be transferred on a trolley or a rolling shower chair. So you always want to provide for privacy. Now this is kind of difficult sometimes if you have a rolling shower chair and maybe the person doesn't have a shower in their room and you have to go down the hall. So your facility should be providing some kind of cape or covering for that resident to wear as they're going down the hall on their shower chair. Another thing you can do is just leave the person dressed before you get into the shower. Now that may make it a little bit more difficult, but if the person is, maybe their wheelchair is not able to go into the shower room with them, but the shower chair is okay, maybe they're able to stand up with just one person helping. So you can leave their clothes on, get them into the shower room, have them stand up, have them undress, get them back onto the shower chair, do your shower, get them redressed, put them back on the shower chair and get it back down the hall. That might be something that might be um, a feasible option if you don't have a way to get their wheelchair done in there. So you want to make sure that the resident does not have any body parts exposed to others and also make sure that you close those doors, close the blinds, close the shower curtains and just really, really provide privacy for somebody during that shower. So they may be embarrassed to be exposed and be naked in front of somebody, um, not just the CNA, you know, that may still be enough of an experience for them, but having all their neighbors see them when they're naked, that's not something a lot of residents are really gonna want to do. So we want to provide privacy for them. Even if they do want to have that happen, it's still a regulation that we have to provide privacy for them. So if that happens, then let your charge nurse know, and that may be a discussion to be had with the resident and possibly their family. So safe use of a shower chair, make sure that you lock the wheels of that shower chair during the shower. Whenever you have the water temperature, you wanna make sure it's safe. So you might you need to use a bath thermometer. You want to make sure that the water temperature is adjusted to about 105 degrees. Any hotter than that in the person's skin may start to get red. So you want to adjust the water pressure for the resident comfort if you can. Um, ask the resident to check the water temperature and pressure and adjust for comfort. And you may want to check the temperature of the water on your own skin. Um, sometimes direct spray of the water towards the resident during the bath can be a very traumatic thing. So you want to um, ask the resident, is it okay if I spray here or can, you know, do I need to 
put my hand over here and do an indirect spray or just kind of think about what your residents likes and dislikes are and see if there's anything you need to modify. So some things you can do to help prevent the resident from chilling, uh, make sure that the water temperature and the shower room temperature are for the resident's comfort. If you have a heat lamp in there, turn it on. Yes, this is kind of going back to the whole temperature in the room thing where you might be hot, but the resident is comfortable. Remember, it is all about the resident's comfort. You want to prevent drafts in the shower room, so you may have to put towels kind of near the door. Avoid overexposing the resident during the shower and then cover the resident immediately after bathing. Make sure you stay with the resident during the shower because you don't want them to fall out of the shower chair or slip or anything like that. So you want to make sure that you provide for their safety. Some other things um, when the floor is wet, how to keep the resident safe. Check the shower drain to make sure it's functioning. Make sure all the water is draining away. Make sure that weak or unsteady residents are not left alone at all. And it's don't even turn around sometimes because people are quick. Um, if you have to turn around, maybe try to keep a hand on their shoulder or something like that. Um, like if you have to reach for a towel or something. Uh, check the function of all the safety devices like handrails, grab bars, and lifts. Make sure you use bath mats or non-skid strips if people are standing. And some different infection controls for your bathing equipment. Follow your standard precautions, wear your gloves, and make sure that you clean and disinfect all that bathing equipment before and after use per your facility policy and manufacturer instructions. So when you're getting people in and out of a whirlpool or a bath, then you may have to transport them by wheelchair or lift. Make sure that you do all those privacy things that we've been kind of talking about. Um, follow your facility policy and procedure for the lift and the whirlpool use and also for cleaning afterwards. Um, some whirlpool units may be open or closed. So what this means is you may have a tub where the resident can sit down on a bench and then swing their legs in. Then you close the door up um, around them. Or some of them you may have to kind of lower them in with a lift. So maintaining the safe water temperature, again, you're going to make sure that you use that bath thermometer if it's available, not more than 105 degrees. Make sure the pressure and the temper for the resident's comfort and check everything on your arm if you need to. And don't spray them directly unless they really like it. Same kind of things with protecting the resident from the chill, staying with the residents. Make sure that the electrical safety is okay. Check the working status of the hydraulic lifts and other safety aids and follow your facility policy and procedure for reporting problems such as that lockout tagout program if that's available. Make sure that the shower drain is properly functioning. Avoid the use of bath oils because this can make all the surfaces in the bath very, very slick. If somebody likes to have oil, you may put um, baby oil on afterwards kind of as a almost a lotion for them to keep their skin hydrated and make sure that if you're using a hair dryer that you only use it in designated areas and not in the bathtub. <laughs> um, infection control for bathing equipment make sure that you check with the nurse if a resident has skin infections or other break in the skin. Um, also really you shouldn't be putting anybody with a Foley catheter that's um, the tube that goes into their bladder to help drain the urine. If somebody has that in, they really should not be submersed into the tub because all of the bacteria or the debris that's coming off of their body and sitting in the tub water can travel straight up that catheter into their bladder. But double check with your facility to make sure um, of that policy. Um, also follow your standard precautions and make sure you follow your facility policy and procedures and your manufacturer's instructions on how to clean the Whirlpool tub before and after every use. So handling a washcloth if you're helping somebody, forming a mitt is one option for safely handling that washcloth. So what you're going to do is um, kind of wrap it around your thumb, and we'll show you how to do this at the skills lab, and then you can fold it over and tuck underneath. When you're washing somebody's face, you're going to want to form that mitt and use a corner of that mitt to gently, gently go from their inner corner of their eye and sweep to the outer corner of their eye and don't apply any pressure with that because you don't want to hurt their eyeball. Then when you're done with one spot, then you can um, kind of form another mitt with the washcloth and use a different area of the washcloth to do their other eye in the same manner. So keep your resident comfortable, keep them covered, provide privacy, change your water frequently if you need to. 
change your water when moving from um, clean areas to soiled areas and then also when you're moving from soiled areas to clean areas and then also change your water whenever visibly soiled or cool to the touch because you want to keep your residents warm so make sure that you don't expose the residents body parts to everyone keep them covered and knock before you enter the room so you want to provide full view privacy by closing the doors, drawing the privacy curtains, and also closing the, closing the window shades or blinds. You can do a back massage while you're giving a bath. You can do it any time, but giving a bath is a great time to do a back massage. So make sure that you check with your nurse before you're giving a back rub because this can be dangerous to some people if they have any kind of issues. Do not massage any red and bony areas because this can be the sign of a beginning pressure ulcer and if you rub in that area you can actually do more harm, more harm than good. And wear gloves if the resident has skin that is not intact and follow your standard precautions. One of the things I like to do at the very end of a bath if I'm kind of doing a, bath, a back rub <clears throat> excuse me, is to put lotion on. So if I'm giving a bed bath and I've got that base in there and I've got a little bottle of lotion, then what I like to do is I like to actually submerse the little bottle of lotion into the bath water. And the lotion's not going to get into the bath water because it's, you know, completely closed and contained. But what that does is that helps warm up the lotion to where it's not quite as cold when you put it on the resident. Because think about if you've just given the resident a bath, they're kind of exposed, they've had that water on them, they're dry, they might be starting to warm up, and then you stick cold lotion on them. Please don't do that. So that's just one of the tips that you might be able to use to help. So changing the bed linens, we're going to change the bed linens whenever the person has had a bath and when they're soiled. Um, your uniform is considered dirty, so make sure you hold clean linens away from your uniform when carrying. And also, make sure that you don't hold the dirty linens close to your uniform when you're carrying either. Never shake your linens as this spreads microbes, and make sure that you place your clean linens on clean surfaces, and never your dirty stuff on the floor. So you can do a towel bath or a bag bath, and the towel bath uses warm wet towels, and that's going to be on that bathing without a battle video. And then also a bag bath um, or a prepackaged bath. This is saturated wipes that are used that waterless no rinse cleaner. You stick them in the microwave, warm them up, and then just basically wipe the person down, and then towel them off. So the advantage to that is that the person can get, do one section at a time. If they don't have very much endurance or energy and they only want to do maybe their upper body today and maybe do their lower body tomorrow, that's fine. We can use that prepackaged stuff and get that accomplished. Another thing that that will help with is um, to keep the person from getting too cold from being exposed all at one time. One of the things you need to worry about though with these is safety because these bag baths, they can get extremely hot, especially on the outside of the packaging. So you, yes, we want them to be warm, but we don't want them to be so hot that they will hurt the resident's skin. And if you have, um, they have bag baths that are specifically for washing hair. So they'll have a little hair cap in a bag and you can put that in the microwave as well and it's got kind of a pre-moistened washcloth on the inside lining of the cap and then you can put it on the person's hair and just kind of scrub their hair and then dry it where you don't have to use any water. Those again can get very very hot very quickly so just make sure that you don't stick really really hot stuff on your residence. Yes we want it to be warm, we want it to be comfortable um, and the warm feels good but you don't want it to burn their skin. So pericare consists of bathing the resident from front to back between their legs. This is typically done during incontinence care as well, so it's a good idea to know how to do it. Now, remember, always front to back. Every single time you're going to wipe front to back. So residents who are incontinent um, of urine or feces, which is also known as a bowel movement or BM, receive that perineal care after each time that they are incontinent and then also any time that you give somebody a bath. So females, you're going to wash between the labia and around the labia and then around the anus. So just get all that area in the groin and then between the labia and around the anus. And men, you're going to clean 
under the foreskin if they are not circumcised and wash the scrotum and around the anus. Now, if men are not circumcised, you will have to actually use your fingers to retract the foreskin very gently, very, very gently, pull the foreskin back, clean the tip of the penis, and replace the foreskin. Now, this is very important that you replace the foreskin because if you don't, the tip of the penis can become swollen and cause it where the foreskin cannot go back to where it's supposed to be. And that can be very, very painful and uncomfortable for somebody. So you wanna make sure to wash the scrotum and around the anus, especially when a man has been incontinent of BM because a lot of times the BM not only will go up between their buttocks and around their buttocks, but it will come in the front um, under and around their scrotum. So make sure that you get everything like that clean as well. When you're using washcloths and wipes, always use your standard precautions and wear gloves. Wipe from clean to dirty, front to back. Do not use, um, do not reuse the wipes and then double bag used wipes and disposed of in a soiled utility. So this doesn't mean that you have to use trash bags, um, two trash bags before you even leave the room. If you've got a regular trash bag in the room, you've used the wipes, tossed them in the trash bag, tie the trash bag up, take it down to your soiled utility, and then you're going to have a big trash bin down there with another bag in it. So always, always, always wash from front to back. The front area is going to be considered clean, and the urinary meatus is the, ur the opening for the urine to come out from the body. And then the back area is considered dirty, and that is the anus, where the bowel movement comes out. Always, always, always keep your privacy, keep your dignity, knock before entering, keep all of your curtains and your privacy um, windows closed. So using a urinary catheter, we will talk about that in Skills Lab and teach you guys how to do that. So perform your catheter care according to the facility policy. And the way that you do basic catheter care is where you will hold onto the catheter with your thumb and forefinger near the entrance to the body, so near the urinary meatus, and then you will take a washcloth or a wipe and wipe down and away from the body. Make sure that you hold on to that catheter near the entrance because the catheter is actually a tube that goes into the body from the outside, it goes straight up into the bladder through the urethra, and it's inflated with a balloon with water in it that will hold it inside the bladder. So if you're trying to wipe down and away with that catheter and you're pulling on it, that's going to be really uncomfortable for that person because you're actually tugging on that balloon and you can cause some trauma inside the bladder. So do not disconnect the catheter or pull the catheter out of the urinary meatus. Do not raise the catheter bag higher than the bladder because that catheter bag is dependent on gravity for drainage. So it's always going to go, you know, from a higher area to a lower area. So your body should be higher than the catheter. And make sure that that tubing is not kinked. Because again, it's going to go from higher to lower. And if you've got the tubing kinked, all that urine is not going to be able to drain into the catheter and it's going to back up into the bladder. That can cause bladder infections and a whole host of other problems. So make sure that that tubing is not kinked. Some facilities may also want you to use skin barrier products. Um, some skin barrier products can be things like butt paste or zinc oxide or just barrier cream. A lot of places now are going to using barrier creams on people every time that they are provided incontinence care. So every time that they're incontinent, if you clean them up, then you can put a barrier cream on. So make sure that you follow standard precautions. And then if you are applying that barrier cream, if you've already done the act of cleaning the resident, do not use the same gloves that you use to wipe the resident to apply that barrier cream. Stop, change your gloves, and then apply the barrier cream. Because once you've used those wipes, those gloves are considered dirty. So you need to put new gloves on and then apply that barrier cream. So clean all your contaminated areas that are contaminated with urine or feces when the resident is incontinent. Don't forget the low abdomen, the buttocks, and the thighs. With the back rub again, if you're giving this as part of the bathing routine, this can really help relax and stimulate um, circulation for your resident. Make sure that you use proper body mechanics. Um, working level is usually waist high. 
Don't forget to put the bed down when you're done. Make sure your resident is in a comfortable and safe position. Check your resident care plan and your nurse regarding the use of gloves and other personal protective equipment. I personally would go ahead and wear gloves anyway, especially if I'm putting lotion on, just to keep, um, to keep yourself and your resident safe and just in case you would come in contact with any broken skin that you may not have seen before. So you can use lotion according to the resident's care plan. You can warm it by hand motion prior to using on the skin or warm it in that bath water. Um, massage strokes, um, we're gonna kind of talk about that in skills lab as well. And then do not massage any reddened or broken areas on the resident's skin because this can actually make things worse. So dressing and undressing a resident. So your residents are encouraged to dress in street clothing instead of gowns, robes, and slippers because we're trying to deinstitutionalize our nursing homes and facilities. So what this means is you want the resident to wear what they normally would wear at home because this is their home. Make sure that they're ready to participate in any social activities that they want to. Make sure appropriate underwear is worn. Um, make sure that if you're putting on clothing or the term don means to put on, loose fitting is loose fitting clothing is easier to don or to put on. And the clothing should be clean and in good repair. If you notice that clothing is not in good repair, then you might let the charge nurse know and they may have to contact the family to maybe get the resident some new clothes. So your resident should absolutely be helping you select clothing to be worn. If the resident has dementia, you can pre-select a few options that are appropriate for the time of year and maybe, you know, just present those options to the person with dementia. So rather than saying, you know, wheeling somebody over or taking them over to the closet, opening the closet and saying, okay, what do you want to wear today? How daunting is that when you go open your own closet at home and decide what you want to wear today? I know for some of us that's really kind of difficult if you have a lot of clothing items and you look at everything and it's kind of overwhelming and then if you're like me you think well i have nothing to wear even though you have a ton but some of your residents may be very intimidated by this so especially people with dementia they are so overwhelmed by choices that they can't even process it so maybe take two or three items out and say okay would you like to wear this one or this one and if they pick one Great. If they don't pick one, maybe put one back, get a different one, say this one or this one, and kind of simplify the choices. You still want to give that person with dementia the choice because that's still their decision. However, you can make it a little bit easier for them to understand and be able to move forward with that. So some different things that we need to think about with helping people get dressed. Make sure that you check the care plan for their restorative goals. And we absolutely want to encourage as much independence and self-care as possible. So you may have to divide the dressing procedure into segments if the resident has difficulty comprehending what's going on or they cannot physically complete the entire activity at one time. So if you have somebody with dementia and you go into the room, you help them pick out their clothing, and then you say, okay, let's put your shirt on, let's put your socks on, let's put your pants on and your shoes and we're going to brush your hair and we're going to comb, we're going to brush your teeth and we're going to go out to breakfast. That's a lot of stuff that you've just done for somebody with dementia and it's going to take them a lot longer to process. So we want to kind of keep it scaled down and maybe say, okay, let's put your shirt on. Maybe go step by step. Okay, let's put your arm in. I'm going to pull it over your head, put your other arm in. I'm going to pull it down your front and your back, get it all straightened out. Great. Now let's move on to the pants. So chunk it up into easy, understandable tasks and don't give them too many things at a time. So one arm, um, place one arm at a time into a shirt or a blouse, especially if people have painful or limited flexibility. This is especially important if resident has a weak side, such as somebody that's had a stroke. If they have a weak side or a paralyzed side that doesn't work at all, make sure that you dress that side first. So say your resident has had a stroke. His left arm is completely paralyzed. He cannot move it at all. What you're gonna do is place that arm through the sleeve first, go around the back, and then help them bend the right arm, put it through that sleeve, and then finish getting him dressed. So make sure that you always dress the weak side first. 
Now, when you're getting somebody undressed, we go in the opposite manner. So that's where we would bend the right arm, remove the right arm from the shirt, go around the back, and slide the clothing down the left arm. Now be very careful to support the arm that is weak or paralyzed during this process because if you have that arm up and then you just let it drop and it hits their side, they may still be able to feel pain even if they can't move their arm. So be very careful and be respectful of that. Pay attention if somebody has IV tubing or if any, any tubing at all, um, especially if they have IV tubing going into their arm, any gastrostomy tubing into their stomach or a urinary catheter, make sure you handle those with care. And remember, those have to be threaded through the clothes as well. The gastrostomy tube may not be, but the IV tubing needs to be threaded through shirts and the urinary catheter a lot of times will be threaded through pants. So make sure that you keep an eye on that and keep the tubing from kinking or disconnecting. So some general grooming guidelines, make sure that you clean and groom the hair and nails because this is very associated with a person's sense of well-being and you want to encourage your residents to do as much as possible. So pay attention to their sense of dignity and see how they like to be groomed. If you see someone that seems to take pride in their appearance, they've always got their hair combed very nice, they've always, you know, got clean shirts on, always buttoned up, um, they always wear slacks and nice socks and dress shoes, pay attention to that. If you're taking care of that person the next day and they always wear, you know, the nicer things, chances are unless they're just not feeling well, they probably don't want to be wearing sweats and a t-shirt. So pay attention to what your residents' likes and dislikes are. Always check your care plan for restorative goals and encourage self-care by setting up needed supplies and equipment. Sometimes all your residents will need with grooming is for you to get stuff out and they can do the rest. So you might need to get their comb out from the medicine cabinet or get their makeup out and they can take care of the rest of it. They just need you to set it up. So again, just like getting clothing together, getting dressed, if you have somebody, especially with dementia, you may have to chunk up that grooming into segments if the resident has difficulty comprehending the entire procedure and use gestures and um, ways that the resident will be able to interpret what you're supposed to be doing. So if you give a hairbrush to somebody with dementia, they might think that they're supposed to use it as a lint roller and get rid of lint on their clothing. They don't understand that it's a hairbrush. So then you may hold the hairbrush up kind of up to your own hair and don't brush your own hair, but kind of simulate brushing your hair or give the brush to them and maybe guide their hand up to their hair and get them started. And some people will be able to finish that. Once they're finished with that, then you move on to the next task. So make sure that you comb or brush that resident's hair daily, especially if you have people that like to stay in one spot all night. They're going to have their hair that gets very, very flat in the back. So it might kind of push up in the back um, to the top and then push down in the bottom. And they're kind of left with a little open spot in the middle of their hair. And people can't see in the back of their head. So you may have to help them realize that they need to brush their hair in the back. So arrange the hair in appropriate manner acceptable to the resident and family. Be careful of those ladies, especially that go to the beauty shop and don't brush all their hair out if they just got it curled yesterday. Uh, make sure that people are in front of the mirror because a lot of times that will help them kind of pick up the cues what they're supposed to be do, supposed to be doing. And brushing and combing the hair will stimulate the blood circulation and distribute oils over the hair surface. So keep everything um, nice. So make sure that you have your tangled hair that is combed from the end and not the crown and hold on to the hair as you are combing away from the head. Um, if you're doing the combing of the hair for the bed bound resident, you may raise the resident to the Fowler's position if permitted by their care plan. Use your good body mechanics and get them up to your height. You might want to place a towel under the resident's head or across the shoulders, and you might need two people assisted to kind of help them lean forward a little bit um, to get everything brushed or combed. So you might want to also check the resident's care plan regarding any special hair care procedures, um, products, or equipment. 
So some general rules for cutting hair, the resident's hair is cut as the facility policy allows and with consent of the resident and family members, you will not have to cut their hair. So there's a lot of places that will have beauty salons or beauty operator that will come in and do that for you. So some residents will also have the regular appointment with the beauty shop. So they will have to pay for this service and make sure that you coordinate bathing so that the style is not removed. So if you have a resident that gets their hair done every Wednesday afternoon, you might ask them, well, would you like to have your shower Wednesday morning or your bath Wednesday morning? That way they're automatically going to be going and getting their hair done and you're not going to ruin their style. So always check the resident's care plan of how often they need to have their hair shampooed, generally at least once a week, maybe twice a week. Make sure that you get all the soap rinsed thoroughly from the hair because that can build up and make the scalp very itchy. Um, if you need to use any conditioner or detangler, make sure you check your care plan and check the care plan for washing different varieties of hair. And then if you're shampooing hair for a resident who cannot take a tub bath or shower, sometimes, sometimes you can use some different things like a shampoo board or a shampoo cap for the patient or the resident that's in bed or use some of those waterless um, hair caps with the pre-moistened washcloth in it. Beard care, make sure that if you are providing hair care or shampooing that you wash the beard and wash the beard more often or comb it whenever it, there's food or liquid that's frequently spilled on it. Um, comb or beard the hair when it's comb or comb the beard when hair is groomed and the resident's beard is going to be cut at the facility per the facility policy and with the consent of the resident and family. So just because a man has a beard doesn't mean, mean that he needs to be shaved because he may want to do that himself. He wants he may want to grow a beard and that's fine. As long as you help him clean, keep it neat and clean, then that's, that's all good if they want to grow a beard. So a lot of male residents will shave daily unless they prefer different intervals. You want to position that resident in front of the mirror if possible because they may be able to do the shaving themselves, um, you want to have the nurse determine the appropriate razor for safe use. People with um, blood thinners should not be using regular razors. They should not be using disposable razors and need to use electric razors. That way, just in case there's a cut, then, or, you know, the disposable razors are more likely to cut the face and to cause bleeding than an electric razor would. And when you are done with that disposable safety razor, you want to put it in the sharps container or wherever your facility policy is. So some women may also need some help with um, shaving their facial hair as well. So ask the nurse for direction and you may even ask your resident. We don't want to embarrass our residents, but some of the women, if they notice that their hair is getting a little long on their face or they can see the dark facial hair, they may want it shaved themselves too. So if you have a resident that likes to put on makeup, make sure you respect their wishes regarding makeup use and position them in front of a mirror if possible. Sometimes they may just need setup or you may have to do a hand over hand technique to help assist the resident in the application. Just ask them what they want help with. So nail care, make sure you follow that facility policy regarding nail care, clipping and cutting fingernails and toenails. And the nurse will let you know who you can um, clip or file. And then also make sure that you think about your diabetics and the people on blood thinners that either the nurse or the podiatrist will only handle, especially their toenails. So you can do um, a nail soak. So you can kind of put their nails into kind of some soapy water that will help kind of soften up any debris that's under the nails and make it a lot easier to clean. And then you can go from there cleaning and clipping or filing their nails. So you want to make sure that you follow the length and shape of the nails per the resident's preference and look at their skin. Look at the ingrown toenails. Make sure that you report any observations about dryness, redness, cracking, anything like that to the nurse. So a prosthesis is a replacement of a body part. So some examples are prosthetic limbs, breasts, or eyes. And an orthotic device is used mainly to function, um, to maintain the function of a body part to prevent deformity. Um, a splint is a kind of orthotic. So you might have somebody that has um, foot drop. So they might have 
not have any control over whether they can bend their foot up back towards their body. And it kind of hangs there and starts kind of curving downwards and pointing their toes. So they might have some kind of splint on their foot to prevent um, the foot drop from getting worse. So some other devices may assist the resident in maintaining independent function, including glasses and hearing aids. So help your residents properly apply the adaptive devices as part of the dressing at the beginning of the day. Make sure that you know how each one functions and make sure it's clean and operational before assisting the residents to apply. The most important thing when dealing with a prosthetic is to observe the skin area where the device is placed to see that the skin is intact and healthy. Make sure that if you have any changes in the skin or anything different, that you notify the nurse. That concludes our presentation about personal care and grooming. So if you have any questions, please contact your instructor. Most of the things that we've been talking about throughout this unit will be very, very heavily gone over in the skills lab and you will learn how to not only talk about how to groom somebody, you'll learn how to do it. You will learn how to do a bed bath, you'll learn how to brush teeth, you'll learn how to shave people, um, and you'll learn how to do various other things. So please, if you have any questions or if there's anything specific that you really, really want to learn, write it down and bring it to us when you come to Skills Lab. So hope you have a great day. Thank you.